Okay, I hope you can hear me. I'm not yes, sure if do. you can, but this is the uh, miracle of modern technology. So I'm going to hit the video here and start this off. My name is Paul Swinnison, and we are at Cold Creek Ranch, which is outside of Clifton, Arizona, on the New Mexico border. We have a direct personal interest in the health and sustainability of the acres for which we have control over. And so we are engaged in a number of, of very thoughtful practices which are intended to increase biomatter and organic matter, grass cover, wildlife habitat, and we make the world better by doing that. Where and when we can, we're trying to concentrate animal impact into places that we think could be healed with the beneficial aspects of cattle grazing. This burrow weed right here is considered junk. Junk weed. So this is the kind of thing I'm trying to get stomped on. This dead stuff right here, this is the kind of stuff I'd want to get stomped on. All of this very complex mix of species all adds to, you know, what our cattle eat and ultimately influences the flavor of the beef that we sell. And I think that like terroir and wines, that shows and people begin to recognize that there is a soul here. And the cattle that are raised and born here will hit the ground as a calf. They'll grow to a thousand pounds on native rangeland here. We'll take them down to our irrigated pastures, finish them there on green growing irrigated pasture and actually slaughter them there on our own facility and ultimately sell them through the farmer's markets in Tucson and Phoenix. So from pasture to pallet, we influence and affect every stage of that process. Sustainable America is our first institutional investor and they probably represent the cusp of an oncoming wave of large scale investment and impact investment minded nonprofits that would like to see dollars go straight to work, really improving lives and landscapes. And we've just been thrilled that they recognize what it is we're up to and jumped aboard. We are doing to investing into capital what we've already done with food production and direct marketing through farmers markets. The principles are the same. We're trying to rehumanize the relationship between people and their food and people and their money. Okay, well, that was a quick intro. Um, it's a little difficult working here because I have no audio feedback as to audience reception here, so I'm going to assume it's nothing but uh, excellent response on your end. All right, I get, I'm getting a visual thumbs up. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, what we're up to. Uh, this is this is a a, uh, a concept. It's it's semi political, um, in which. The vision here is to reinvent as much as we can sort of a Jeffersonian republic of many, many small landowners and and uh, try to help perpetuate this back the land movement that we're undergoing in America today. Um, real quick background, uh, many of you probably know, but the family farm and the family ranch are, are in precipitous decline. Uh, they are actually disappearing at the rate of 758 a month, which, if you work it out, is actually equal to about one every single hour. So as we sit in here today, there will be one less family farm when we leave. And that's a little frightening, but this is an optimistic message, um, actually. Uh, it's my, my hope that uh, we, can, we can actually come back, that we as Americans can come back to the land, albeit on a new and modern footing, but with, but with uh, echoes of the past. So here's where the politics comes in. Uh, I find myself straddling a political fence practically all the time. But if you look on the left, uh, you know, what I call the Occupy Wall Street type uh, tends to uh, demonize most of what most of big business, most uh, corporations as that's the source of, of what ails us politically. Whereas you have what I call the, the Tea Party set on the other side of the spectrum, which, which says that it is uh, big government that it is what ails us and so forth. 
I contend that from an agrarian's perspective, they're both equally pernicious. Um, they're both squeezing the agrarian way of life out of existence. And that's what I'm hoping to, to uh, resurrect. Uh, a little bit of, of detailed sort of data background. So from a perspective of the media, and today, the top four companies control 85% of the overall beef industry, which is massive consolidation and rather frightening when you think about it. Um, it's not just beef. Uh, big milk is also to blame. Uh, in 1965, there were 1.1 million uh, dairy producers nationwide, and today there are 63,000, which is a literally a 90% decrease in the number of people actively, actively running a dairy. And it's not just in ag either. Uh, this this is across the system. Um, in 1997, the six largest banks held about 17% of GDP. Today, the six largest banks control or actually have access to. Uh, over one half of, of the nation's GDP, contain one half of the GDP. This chart here shows the percentage of the population actively engaged in agriculture, and this is, this is probably not a surprise to many of you. You know, it's gone from, from well over 50% in the 1870s to less than 2% today. Um, there's, a, there's a slight bump, though, and, and it would be interesting to see what this trend line looks like in, in another 50 or 100 years. What I wanted to point out here is that all through this decline, there was a steady litany of government programs designed to, quote, save the family farm, none of which are obviously did the trick, as we can tell. Um, real quick, also going back to, going back to uh, you know, government intervention in agriculture, in 1933, the very first action taken under the Roosevelt administration uh, was the Agricultural Ad Adjustment Administration. They actually butchered, uh, with, with intent to prop up prices, they actually butchered six million baby pigs, um, had government employees going out and killing baby pigs in order, to, in order to save the pig farmers by increasing the price for the commodity. And in Alabama, they, they forced every uh, cotton farmer to plow under every third row of cotton, again with the intent to manipulate the market and ensure that the price of the commodities would go up. So whether it's corporations or whether it's business, it's pretty clear that, that uh, the family farm basically stands at the bottom of the heap and, and suffers the blows from, from on high. I do think we can fix this. I think it is well within all of our power to regrow these agrarian roots. And I'm going to talk about four ways to do that. Uh, the first one, is, you know, it's kind of cute, but I think it matters. The idea is to get some land. It doesn't have to be a, a whole lot. It doesn't have to be a huge spread of land, but any any plot you can get your hands into where you have sunlight, soil, and living things will give you a glimmer of, of self-sufficiency. Growing that tomato in your, in your window box does something to the psyche and to the soul, and I think it's important, um, it, both, both politically and, and physically. The second way we can regrow agrarian, agrarian roots is, is to actually support and buy from agrarians. Uh, you know, farmers' markets are a tremendous and growing vehicle for reconnecting people in urban centers to where their food is coming from. And probably many in this, this gathering uh, can attest to that. Uh, third way is, is more than just buying the produce, also consider actively investing, consciously investing in, in ways that can help maintain and protect agrarian uh, landscapes. Uh, we have, you know, there's there's a number of here. Slow Money International is is a is large and growing uh, vehicle and venue for doing this. Community supported agricultures are local ways of doing this. Um, we ourselves are embarked on on something called the Conservation Capital Fund, which is doing this. And it's just amazing to see people flock to the idea that they can invest their money instead of this relatively anonymous, uh, you know, money market. They can actually directly invest it and see the returns themselves and know that they're actively involved in their investment. Uh, something near and dear to my heart is as this young agrarian movement begins to gain steam, what we're finding is that a lot of the small landowners are finding themselves faced with the kind of legal restrictions that apply to the giants of the industry, the Monsantos and the Cargills and so forth. 
I think if there's going to be a vibrant and and uh, sustainable middle ground here of uh, sustainable small scale agriculture, we all need to fight back on uh, on overregulation. I just got a one in front of me. I assume that means one minute. <laughs> so I'll go quickly through the rest of this. Uh, we're actively involved in trying to get one million acres in the next ten years under conservation and stewardship. We've got ten thousand so far um, in the first first year. Uh, so. <laughs> we've got we've got our work ahead of us, but uh, we're working on it. Um, our investors receive a nine percent return on investment, partly in cash and partly in in ranch access and beef. It's it's complicated, but um, anybody interested can can reach out to me later. Um, the idea here again is to get get land into the hands of actual landowners, a, a younger set of agrarians who live on the land and manage it with with sustainability in mind. And that will do amazing things for all of our, our watersheds. We've actually started to build a couple. We're going to be building three tiny homes like this on our conserved. I got a zero in front of me, so I'm going to call that, <laughs> call that quits here. Um, why don't we kick it over to questions and answers? Although how in the world I'm going to hear them is beyond me, but maybe, maybe you guys have a system. I've been told that you can hear us now. I can hear you now. Excellent. So, uh, if, if you can't hear the questions from the audience, I'll go ahead and relay them. But are there any questions from the audience right now? Go ahead. You mentioned that um, uh, government, big government and big business this both are pernicious. And I, I think that's probably obvious. But the question I have for you is um, how can government policy be uh, made in, a, in such a way that, that alleviates the burden on small farmers and alleviates the inevitable inevitable uh, decline of the small farmer because isn't really the problem uh, uh, just an economic problem that people prefer cheaper, better food and or cheaper what they what appears to be cheaper, better mm -hmm. food. Don't they simply buy big beef because it's cheaper? So how do we get policies that make uh, small produced beef viable economically? Yeah. No. It's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, I am hesitant whenever it comes to a policy question to immediately jump to policy solutions because, frankly, I think many of, the, if not most, maybe even all of the policy solutions are, in fact, the very problem themselves. You'll find, and it doesn't take long in the history of the beef industry to recognize that, that the biggest supporters of policies, regulations, health codes, and so forth were generally big business, armor of armor and swift was was renowned for saying that he never found a regulation he didn't like. And so we've created ourselves sort of this this uh, vicious cycle in which you know it, it's the classic question of of mercantilism or regulatory capture where business is so conjoined with government policy that you begin one begets the other. So, you know, this this may sound idealistic, but frankly, I think that the best solution we have is to allow individuals to transact freely and you will find people flocking to that middle ground. You will find people like myself who are selling our product to people willing to pay very high prices. This goes back to your pricing question. People are paying, you know, eight, nine dollars a pound for ground beef because they know where it comes from. They know how it's raised and they're willing to pay that. And we have, you know very, very well-intentioned and enlightened bureaucrats busily trying to stop that transaction from occurring. Your beef raised without antibiotics and is it grass-fed and is it available online and if so, where do we find it? <laughs> I, I love these kind of questions. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, it is raised without antibiotics. Yes, it is grass-fed. Um, we are try, you know, we've been focusing on, on local markets in Tucson and Phoenix, but, uh, we are, we are actively trying to get onto overstock.com. Believe it or not, they actually approached us. And so look for that. Um, our website is doublecheckranch.com and we do, we do ship. So <laughs> it's the, the uh, marketing plug here. Double stock Hi, I know Aldo Leopold is gone, but have Peter Singer and Jim Mason um, approached you or bought into what you're trying to do? Um, no, they haven't. Um, I, I'll admit I don't know the names, and that might embarrass myself. But uh, we're actually in Aldo Leopold country, and if they're if they're uh, uh, disciples of Leopold, then, then uh, pass them my name. I'd love to speak with them. 
Okay, I'll send something to you. It's uh, the ethics of eating meat. It's uh, on um, responsible raising of, of um, poultry and, and uh, fish and, and uh, animals. And pretty much argue a lot of what you do, uh, what you were saying today, um, which is also sort of an offshoot of Leopold, the sustainable land. So. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Would you consider doing a mentorship program with us for current students that are interested in farming and sustainability? Certainly. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea how one would go about doing it, but uh, I'm impressed with what we've managed to accomplish with Skype today, so the sky's the limit as far as I'm concerned. Coming from an Air Force Academy. <laughs> so there's a three-year limit on uh, farmers who want to use their land and call their pro products organic. In other words, they can't call it organic unless they don't use fertilizers for three years. In the cattle industry, is there a similar uh, rule that you can't call a cow grass-fed unless he hasn't had antibiotics for a certain period of time, or antibiotic-free unless he hasn't had antibiotics for a certain period of time? Yeah, great question. And th this this gets, uh, once again, to the root of the matter. Um, it, it is... It's complex. We, we ourselves market our beef as what we call sort of tongue-in-cheek beyond organic, um, and that is because we have not solicited, sought out organic certification um, for, for the reasons you mentioned about, you know, it's, it's you know, time-consuming and so forth, but ultimately the consumers have recognized that the organic label that comes from the USDA doesn't mean what they think it means. Um, for instance, organic, organic meat is allowed to be doctored with ivermectin, which is a very intense uh, antibiotic, um, you know, prior to slaughter. We, we simply don't do that on our, on our cattle. Um, there is currently no grass-fed label managed and, and operated by, by the USDA, and I'm glad of that, to be honest. I mean, I, I, sound, I must sound terrible to you, I suppose, but I'm, I'm glad that's not the case. I'm glad that people are actively soliciting out their own certification. We are consumer certified. They understand, they understand what we do, why we do it, and that is what truly matters. And, you know, some complicated form isn't going to make that much better. Uh, have you experienced the prussic acid problem or any other problem in grass feeding cattle? No, not really. Uh, we, you know, the the acid the acid issue is is a fascinating one, and it sounds like you know your you know your your veterinary science pretty well. But you know, we we are aware of of the differences in in uh, in the dietary you know the dietary component and its acids. And this you know you probably know about the E. coli uh, resistant strains or the the acid resistant strains of E. coli and so forth. We find that raising cattle on native grasslands and moving them very often in a holistic management plan takes care of almost all of these, uh, you know, problems that we had created by trying to confine and feed animals. Um, so I hope that answers your question, and, and it's it's pretty in depth, but we can get into it later if you want. Any more questions in the audience? So I, I've asked this of other uh, speakers today, uh, and so I asked this of you as well. What has been your greatest success or you are most proud of, and what has been the greatest challenge, uh, whether it be with the business or for you personally? Wow, it's like an interview question. Um, I, think, I think, frankly, the, the biggest success has been watching – the level of enthusiasm from customer base, you know, from our customer base in Tucson and Phoenix, we're, we're blessed. I mean, it's just dumb luck that we are, you know, our ranch is, 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 um, bookended by, by two very large Metro centers. It's interesting that Tucson has more people than all of Montana, for instance. Um, and, but it's been, but it's been wonderful to see the reception we've gotten for our product. Um, you know, we went from selling about $12,000 a year in beef when I first came back to the family operation and we're well over half a million dollars a year in selling, selling grass-fed beef, and I would have never dreamed that was even possible. Um, so that's been a big success. The biggest challenge, I'm sure I'm going to sound like a broken record, but the biggest challenge has been, you know, we, we operate and, and manage our own packing house as well, which means that we must abide 
you know, right or wrong, we must b abide by the very same USDA stipulations as, you know, the gigantic Cargill plant in, in Omaha, which processes 100,000 animals a week. Uh, we do maybe 150 a year. So it's somewhat akin to applying, you know, NASA launch protocols to, say, somebody backing out of their driveway. It is a difference in scale that makes it very, very difficult to operate. It is our perpetual and perennial headache. Um, but, you know, that, that we knew that. That's, the, that's the, the environment we voluntarily chose to enter in. But whatever we can do to try to create a different space for people to thrive and, and, and bring small back would be wonderful. And I'll, I'll throw in one more question. Um, what's the lesson learned that you want us to take away from your talk today? In a one sentence line. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, the, the lesson I believe is centralization is, is always a dangerous thing. You know, top heavy systems are, are doomed to topple. And wherever and whenever we can find diffuse solutions to our political and physical problems, generally the better off they are. So, again, small is, small is beautiful. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. A lot All of right. fun. You guys have a good, good time. <laughs> Thanks. We're going to take a 10-minute break. We'll be back at 5.15, and uh, we'll be back with the next speaker. Thank you.